Hey everyone, I've been recently cooking up a playthrough of Heirs of Fate that tries to achieve near-perfect reliability while still securing a relatively standard turn count. I'm doing this because the units you get in Heirs of Fate are all preset with their own stats, skills, and inventories, similar to the DLC campaigns in Three Houses and Engage. A lot of these units are not very good, meaning performing well with these characters can prove to be a real hassle. I will be covering the story as there are some things I wish to go over in there as well as my general explanation for each chapter's strategy, as I won't be playing as slowly as I normally try to in the map. I shall tell you a story of another realm that I will never forget. Children born during the war were raised in faraway deep realms. When the long war finally came to an end, these children were called home. But on that very day, a force of mysterious soldiers struck the deep realms. The parents fought valiantly to the last to keep their children safe. But one such child, Kana, found herself wandering, lost in every sense. Left alone and bereft to march through the rain, she had no inkling of the many turns of fate to come. The introduction, paired with the first non-narrated piece of dialogue being voiced, led me to believe that this entire story was going to have full voice acting. The fact that it isn't doesn't ruin the experience for me, but it would have definitely been way more enjoyable. Why? The story of this DLC follows an alternate timeline where the units in the first generation all die while protecting their children from Valite soldiers. In Fates, since all children are strictly locked to their fathers and mother for male Kana and Shigure, there's basically no elaboration on who the mothers of these children are. Especially since if you're playing the DLC with a Birthright or Conquest save file, half of the units in this story aren't even obtainable, and Intelligent Systems wanted to circumvent any confusion. However, the lack of mention for one specific character, I'm sure you can guess who, makes some of the later points in the story pretty stupid but I guess that's par for the course for Fate's writing. Thusly, it is. Yeah. Here we're getting properly introduced to what our first three units can do. Kana has been given the Yato in place of her father, Korin, and she will also join oh. equipped with a Kodachi, a 1-2 range sword that can't double enemies. Yeah. She starts as a level 10 Nor Princess, which means she's going to come equipped with Dragonfang and Nobility. Units don't gain experience here, so Nobility is entirely useless, and believe it or not, Dragonfang would technically help me more than hurt me in my strategy. However, I won't be relying on it. Explained in the story, Kana will not come equipped with a dragon stone, as she does not yet know that she can turn into a dragon. <laughs> Selkie is a kitsune, meaning she only uses a beast stone and beast rune as her weapons. Normally in Fates, these aren't very good, and the class as a whole is terrible. But in this chapter, she's by far the best combat unit you have. 
She also comes with a concoction and her Kitsune skills, Even Handed and Beast Bane. These will prove to be extremely useful in my clear. The game tries to sell Mitama as just a standard healer, which she partly is since Shrine Maidens can't use weapons until promotion. She comes with the skill Rally Luck. This skill is broken for my clear, as it allows every single attack in this entire clear except for one to have 100% hit rates. Unfortunately, due to one specific enemy, there is no way to make a 100% reliable clear without having a very lame and lengthy kiting strategy that would last upwards of 50 turns. At that point, a reset to bad luck would be way faster and honestly way less frustrating to play. The in-map cutscenes of this game tend to use existing maps that are already in the base game of Fates. Here, the map layout depicted is the one of Siegbert's Paralogue. Weirdly though, the map itself is actually going to be the same one used in Birthright Chapter 26 and does not elaborate as to why or how you get teleported there. The map layouts are always identical to how they are in their base game. So we'll see Valite replacements of named child characters in place of who they would actually be. For this chapter, that means Laszlo becomes Soleil, and Xander becomes Siegbert. Siegbert will also be able to use Siegfried, much like how Kana can use the Yato here. As it's been shown in the story, our next recruit is Kiragi. Kiragi is annoying in this chapter because his only weapons are the Fujinyumi and the Iron Bow, which have pretty bad hit rates. Luckily, his personal skill is a great help here as it gives him Rally Luck and Rally Speed by simply using the Wake Command. That will be important a couple times, but aside from that, he'll need a lot of help from adjacency bonuses. We also get Kuragi's retainer, Hisame. Hisame is sword locked, like Kana, but he has a few things that makes him different. Since he's in Samurai and not Nor Prince, he has different pair up bonuses and skills. Though here, Vantage and Duelist Blow won't be too useful. His personal skill gives him Rally Skill and Rally Resistance when he uses the Wake Command which will be very useful as most of the enemies in the map use lances, which beats swords in the weapon triangle. The extra skill mitigates the hit rate lost. He also comes with a free practice katana, which is very useful for allowing Hisame to actually double things even with his low speed.
<laughs> Thank you. Before the map begins, we're getting access to the Noble Yato. This upgrades the Yato from 8 to 11 might, and it obtains 5 crit and 10 avoid. More importantly, it gives Kana an extra 2 strength and speed by just being in her inventory which makes her go from a terrible unit to a pretty respectable one. Fun fact, with animations off, you can press the B button during sprite combats to make them go by even faster in the map. This actually works in cutscenes too, and it's not something that I've ever seen documented anywhere. It's useless knowledge, but it's kinda neat. Gods. Mitama immediately begins by giving Rally Luck to all four of her allies. Then, Kana kills the Southern Dark Mage from the left. Hisame goes two spaces above Kana to provide an adjacency bonus to Kuragi, who's now able to reach perfect hit rates with a Fujin Yumi and avoid a counter attack. Selki goes to Isame's right and equips the Beast Rune to kill the fighter on enemy phase. With the Beast Stone, she would take way too much damage, assuming she got hit. Let's go. 
After Mitama rallies for everyone again, Kana goes above the southern fighter and uses the vulnerary that Karagi gave her on the last turn. Hisame goes two tiles away from the fighter to allow Selkie to kill it using his assistance. If both fighters had hit Selkie, she'd have only 6 HP left. Kiragi once again uses the adjacency bonus of three of his allies to kill the fighter under Kana. Kana and Hisame go in range of the two wyverns that Percy spawned with, and Selkie sits in between them to dual strike. If Selkie had gotten hit earlier, I would have used one of the concoctions. It's important for Selkie to mostly be using the Beast Stone on this map because it's by far the most accurate weapon I have at my disposal. The Beast Rune is mostly unreliable. Kana goes below the wyvern that Hisame fought and kills it. With Rally Luck, Selkie reaches perfect hit rates on Percy without having any adjacency bonuses, which allows her to guarantee enough chip damage for Kuragi to kill him with the Iron Bow instead of the Fujin Yumi. Hisame goes to Selkie's right to beat the Lancer towards him. Even at Weapon Triangle disadvantage, it's easy for Hisame to reach perfect accuracy with his personal skill. Kiragi goes under Hisame to kill the Lancer. Thankfully, he doesn't need much assistance to kill things when he has Weapon Triangle advantage. <laughs> Kana takes a concoction from Selkie and pairs up with her to get dropped in range of another Lancer. Hisame goes above Kana to provide adjacency bonuses, as well as heal himself with a concoction that I just put in Kana's inventory. Hisame's hit rates aren't perfect here, but Kana does have enough damage on her own to kill. Tama heads left and once again heals Kana. Most of my units will stay out of the freeze range, except for Kuragi, who will bait the Troubadour to force specific enemy movements. Kuragi pairs up with Kana, and Kana equips the Kodachi. Everyone else huddles up in a square around Kana, which once again forces specific enemy movement. There is some slight variation on where the outlaws can end up, but out of the four outcomes that I've seen, only one forces different positioning, and even then, it doesn't mess with the rest of the clear in the slightest. Kiragi gives Kana to Selki, and then kills the outlaw that attacked her on enemy phase. Selkie moves two tiles to the left and one tile north to kill the outlaw in one round. Yay! Hisame goes above Selkie and uses the practice katana in order to kill the third and final outlaw. <laughs> Mitama separates Kana from Selkie in a way that would normally activate Haiku, which would be more important if Kana had actually gotten hit. 
Kiragi pairs up with Mitama, and then Kana takes Kiragi so he can wait in range for the enemy maid approaching my units. With Kana's pair up and the speed rally he gets from his personal skill by waiting, he's able to one round the maid with the iron bow. Selkie finally kills the troubadour. Asame goes on Selkie's left to bait over the final two lancers we'll face. After Rally Luck, Hisame kills the weak Lancer, who will always die to Selkie's dual strike even if Hisabe misses. <laughs> Kana kills the second Lancer. Technically it's more consistent to kill from above Hisame to account for all other forms of random movement, but the end result will never really change. Selkie goes above Kana and uses the HP tonic while also baiting the two knights in the nearby hallway. She also takes Kiragi from Kana to guarantee that she'll survive this enemy phase. Kiragi switches to kill the knight left at full HP. Kana should always be able to kill the weak knight with the Kodachi. I'm spending the next few turns healing and heading towards Soleil's group. The movement here isn't super strict, but I need to make sure that I get over there before Selkie's guard gauge with Kiragi goes out. It's important that Silky gets the luck rally here because in order to go in range of the two mercenaries on the left, but not anyone else, she has to go directly above a stairs tile, which ruins her accuracy on one of them. Also, if she isn't at full HP, I need to make sure she stays there. She won't survive two attacks at full health anyways, and from what I understand, if she doesn't get hit by the first mercenary when she's at full, the enemy movement will become sporadic. This is one of the only turns that has a real chance at forcing a reset. Soleil has a killing edge, and is far too bulky to be one rounded in player phase without a crit or dragon fang activation. There is genuinely nothing that can be done about Soleil's crit chance, because the unit with the most dodge, Selkie, with rally luck and a beast stone, still faces at least 3% crit rates against Soleil. The only way to safely dispose of her is to kite her around the map and then only attack her at range or when your guard gauge is full. That would take way too long and would be way slower than just simply resetting. The formation I have does change enemy movement based on if Kana takes damage here, but assuming no crits, there should never be a death that spawns from it. Right. 
Unfortunately, we do have to count on Kana hitting at least one attack here. I'll briefly go over the actions that I do in case Soleil attacked Selkie and not Kana. The other mercenary would prefer to attack Mitama, so Mitama moves out of the way and Kana takes her place to kill the mercenary that would have attacked her. Make sure that Kana is healthy for this. Selkie then goes to where Kana would be and then kills Soleil. putting Kiragi in range of one of the knights in Ignatius' group. All three of these enemies have two range, so the only way to enemy phase them is with a bow at the edge of their ranges or the Kodachi. Kana will back Kiragi up with her Armor Slayer Dual Strike. She's pairing up with Selkie because the luck she gets from pair up is needed for perfect accuracy. You're, you're right. <laughs> Kana goes in the spot where the knight attacked Kiragi and is able to one round Ignatius with the very accurate armor slayer. Hisame should always be able to go above Kana and kill the other one. Everyone starts heading for the door. Kana's done for this map, so she doesn't need to be healed anymore. Kiragi, however, does. Unfortunately, the only unit who does good damage with good accuracy to Valoria is Selkie. But Valoria also one-shot Selkie, so I need to build Guard Gauge off one of the maids here. This is the only other time where a reset might be forced if you're unlucky. Kiragi can easily kill the other maid. Thanks to Selkie's personal skill, along with Even Handed now being activated, Valoria easily dies to Kiragi's chip damage and then Selkie's main attack. Hasame can now go next to Selkie and take the Kodachi from Kana to kill the final mate. I apologize. My Selkie here can attack into Siegbert and block with her guard gauge on the next turn. But if anything looks dicey for her, she will never be in serious trouble as long as you only attack Siegbert in enemy phase and heal on player phase.
Let's go! Wait. Listen. Understood. You have my support. No. No. Thank you. Oh. Huh? Truly. Throughout the Fire Emblem series, there has always been a unique object that is actually dubbed as the Fire Emblem. In the Arcanea games and Awakening, it's Marth Shield. In the Jugdral series and Three Houses, it's in the form of a crest, being the Crest of Velthamer and the Crest of Flames. In FE6 and 7, it's the Seal of Burn. The list goes on. In Fates, the Fire Emblem takes the form of a sword, being the Omega Yata. I think it's definitely one of the cooler forms the Fire Emblem has taken. I, don't know. I feel like there was a lot of mispotential with it. Shigure has recorded voice lines for this entire song, and it plays in the final map of this DLC, which we got to hear more of it here. <laughs> <laughs> 